This month on In Case You Missed It. Light pollution is taking away our connection to the night sky. But in one Rhode Island town, darkness still offers a breathtaking window into the universe. There's a new type of therapy on our shores that helps teens with autism, Down syndrome, ADHD, depression, and anxiety build their confidence and become water athletes. And discover Rhode Island PBS's spooky side as we bring back some Halloween and fall favorites. All this and much more in case you missed it. Welcome to In Case You Missed It. As always, we're taking a look back at some of the best recent content from Rhode Island PBS that you can watch online now. First on our list, 99% of Americans live with light pollution, which means we're unable to see stars and constellations familiar to our ancestors. As part of the continuing Green Seeker series, Rhode Island PBS Weekly visits the Frosty Drew Observatory and Sky Theater in Charlestown where they're saving the night sky. When I think of light pollution, I often think of Van Gogh. You know, his Starry Night is one of the most searched and sought after pieces of artwork. It's incredible. And I think, what would that painting look like if he had looked out and saw light pollution in France when it was, you know, inspiring him? and all of those beautiful swirls that you see in the night sky that he created, they would have been just blobs of yellow fog. If you want to be inspired like Van Gogh was inspired, where do you go in Rhode Island? For me, I go to Charleston. The only place in Rhode Island that I've ever seen the Milky Way is in Charleston. My children went many years having never seen the Milky Way, and when they first saw it in Charleston when we were down at Frosty Drew, they were absolutely amazed. Charleston is this little, like, gem in Rhode Island. Hi, how are you guys tonight? How many for? Once you leave the beach, okay. The quest isn't over because now when the sun sets, you have thousands of stars overhead that you're not going to see pretty much anywhere else you're going. Frosty Drew to me is, it's like the little observatory that could for an island. It gives you these fantastic views. And the Milky Way is starting to become even more visible to us right now. It's a pretty powerful experience. I think of light pollution as just too much light where it shouldn't be. It's this idea that there is an extraordinary amount of light that is unnecessary, that is directed into the wrong place, that's crowding up the sky where we cannot see the night sky any longer. We cannot see the stars that we've been able to see for generations. There's a great deal of light pollution in Rhode Island because we're situated in the Northeast and the Northeast is really densely populated. So when you've got that dense population, what happens is typically is that you've got a lot of buildings, a lot of structures, and those buildings and structures are lit up pretty heavily. If you went to a spot like Frosty Drew, then you can get outside of a lot of it and actually see a lot more stars. But the majority of people living in Rhode Island, they don't see the Milky Way. They don't look up at that sky and see an inspirational view. They see light pollution. I do think there's excess lights when you're walking around Providence at night. I would say there are areas to be able to fix that I think wouldn't cause a lot of problems to change. Even things like the way, say, the state house is lit up at night, that could be done, I think, a little bit more subtly. 
making sure all of the street lights, the neighborhood lights, the city lights in general are well shielded, which means the light is being directed down. Because when you have an unshielded light, there's a whole lot of excess light that just goes, bounces right up to the sky. It's not about removing lights, not completely. It's about lighting better. It's about lighting smarter. And I feel like that's one thing I actually really appreciate about the topic of light pollution. I feel like it is eminently fixable. Of all the pollution issues that are out there, this is the one that the everyday person can really make a huge difference in with such a minimal effort. When you come in at night, turn off your lights. You can watch the full Rhode Island PBS Weekly story on ripbs.org weekly. Our next story, also from Rhode Island PBS Weekly, features a group of surfers in Little Compton who are said to be performing miracles with neurodivergent and non-ambulatory teens. At Gnome Surf, we, we surf with over 3,000 athletes and families. Uh, what we do is surf therapy. Our athletes at Gnome Surf are uh, typically neurodivergent. We're for all kids. Uh, we've built our program on inclusion, but I'd say not, over 95% of our athletes either have autism, Down syndrome, ADHD, depression, or anxiety. My name is Christopher Anteo. I'm the executive director and founder of Gnome Surf. My name's Mackenzie Palumbo and I'm Cash and Hollis's mom. Cash and Hollis are 13 years old. They're twin boys. They were diagnosed at 15 months of age with autism uh, and a handful of other diagnoses. Both of my boys are pretty much nonverbal. Hollis is nonverbal. Cash has some language. These are kids that typically do not get invited to birthday parties or sleepovers. To see them having fun, doing something that typical kiddos do, it's a feeling like no other. Every time I stand on that shore and I watch my kids out on the board, I always think to myself, this is what parents of typically developing children must feel like when they watch their kids play baseball or football or soccer and you just feel so proud. My name is Gio Matram. I'm the lead instructor here at Gnome Surf. So I was born brain damage. It's led to like brain aneurysms, scattered bleeding spots. It's led to a whole host of different challenges for me. The most prominent has been sensory regulatory and then social situations. I couldn't speak till I was like six. And then it's been a long journey to this point of verbalization. I've also had seizures, general motor skill um, challenges, so to say. Luckily, Gnome has helped me recover from that amazingly um, because when you have a lot of this stuff, you have super low self-esteem, super low confidence. Um, it's helped my balance, um, my social skills, and has overall turned me into a more well-rounded human and athlete, I would, I would say. I started surfing with Chris seven years ago and I started teaching three to four years ago. I've seen Gnome from all different angles. I've seen what the surf therapy does and how amazing of an impact it has and the true healing potential and amazingness that it, it gives off. And then I can also see it from the instructor side and how what I do and how I can teach can then heal kids and their certain challenges. Enjoy the full story on ripbs.org slash weekly. And remember to tune in for new episodes of Rhode Island PBS Weekly, Sundays at 7.30 p.m. with an encore on Wednesdays. Next, on Generation Rising, host Dr. Kiara Butler sits down with Katia Osorio and State Senator Tiara Mack to talk about the Doula Act, passed in 2021. 
I know you all just worked to pass a bill mm -hmm. in Rhode Island for doula services. How does that go together hand in hand um, when people just aren't knowledgeable? So what they don't have? the Black Maternal Health Bill, which is the Rhode Island doula bill, mm -hmm. super proud. Um, I was one of the original co-authors of the bill, um, along with certified nurse midwife Melissa Nelson. She's a black midwife um, now in Boston at Boston Medical. And we really did it from the perspective of elevating black doulas in community in a way that was not only accessible, but it was equitable. I think this is the first time that we looked at this as an equitable bill. Um, bill. And I was brought in by a representative, Marcia Ranglin Vassal, because she knew my work in the community with Journey since 2015, doing the work, being a black doula, highlighting black maternal health. And she was like, hey, um, you know, we're being presented with possibly doing this bill. And she's like, I won't do this bill without you. And I was like, of course not, right? Like, because mm -hmm. I'm doing it. Um, and so I appreciate her giving me that direct phone call, having me come in. And then I called in certified nurse, you know, midwife Melissa. And she, me and her, we went over the terminology. What was the scope? What was mm -hmm. the parameters? So I was fortunate enough to be able to work with you and several other people in the bill for all three of those years. Yes. From both the advocate standpoint and the organizing standpoint. And then and finally, in my first year, I was able to help pass that bill. Mm -hmm. And just even being a co-sponsor and having to still educate people. Mm -hmm. Federally, we also passed a momnibus bill, which was about black maternal health as well, because it's a problem nationally. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was just so shocking how few people actually knew or like were able to access the information that black women are dying in childbirth. Watch past episodes of Generation Rising on ripbs.org slash Generation Rising and new episodes every other Friday at 7.30 p.m. In our next clip, Story in the Public Square co-hosts G. Wayne Miller and Jim Ludis talk with Cody Keenan, author of the new book, Grace, President Obama and 10 Days in the Battle for America. So how did you get to work in the White House for Barack Obama? Did you know him uh, before he was elected? I did not. No, I, I'd, I'd spent a few years after college, you know, like I said, I'm a Chicagoan, but I'd spent a few years immersing myself in Massachusetts politics because I was working for Ted Kennedy. And, you know, here's this guy, Barack Obama, who's a rising star in Chicago. And I uh, randomly, you know, when I worked for Senator Kennedy, the Boston, the Democratic National Convention was in Boston in 2004. And we were all allowed to go up and volunteer for the week. We had to take time off work to keep uh, business and politics separate. But our reward was a floor pass to one night of the convention. And I just randomly happened to be on the floor of the convention in the Fleet Center in Boston the night that uh, State Senator Barack Obama, you know, takes the stage largely anonymous and leaves a global megastar. Um, that's when I first got interested in speech writing and interested in him. And I started writing some speeches for Ted Kennedy um, in the Senate. And a mutual friend connected me with John Favreau, who was Senator Obama's speechwriter at the time. And he hired me as an intern early in 2007 on the campaign, and I just, I was too stubborn to leave, so I hung on for the next 14 years. That's tremendous. You know, uh, Cody, you mentioned the West Wing, and I think that for a lot of Americans, their understanding of presidential speech writing is through the eyes and lens of either Toby Ziegler or Sam Seaborn. Uh, what's the reality of being a presidential speech writer? Uh, it's not like that at all. Um, you know, so by the time I left the White House, I became chief speechwriter in the second term. I had a team of eight, uh, and they were just eight, you know, extraordinary writers and extraordinary people. And we wouldn't collaborate on speeches, really, because we found it slowed us down. But we'd, we'd meet every morning. We'd talk about what speeches were coming up. We'd kind of claim the ones that we cared about most. And it's a, it's a solitary endeavor most of the time. You're sitting at your computer, you know, trying to find the right words, uh, the right themes, the right ideas, the right stories. And that's what I love about it. I mean, you, you have to be precise with your language when you're president of the United States. Um, your words can move markets, they can move armies, uh, but they can also move people to a cause, to believe in something, to care. And it's a really incredible gift to have a captive audience, whoever you are. And that's not something President Obama ever puts a waste. So he was also, it was a solitary endeavor for us, but he was also very involved in each speech from the beginning brainstorming sessions to line editing late at night before the speech. You know, we'd often come in at 7 a.m. the day of a speech and get his edits back and he just marked up the thing like crazy. Because um, he cared. I mean, he's a, he was a writer. You know, he'll, he'll, he reminds me to this day that he wrote that uh, Boston speech by himself. A tremendous speech. So, so, you know, specifically, what's it like to work for 
so you know, Barack Obama, I think, is probably uh, generally recognized, whether you like his politics or not, as maybe the greatest American political orator in at least a generation. Um, and he did write that speech, and he did write a couple of best-selling books. What's it like to be the speechwriter for a guy who just himself can flat out write? Uh, it's a wonderful struggle. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's great and it's terrible. You know, it's, it's great to write for a writer because, uh, you know, he'll be there to help you take the speech to a higher place. It's terrible because you'll kill yourself to get him a, a great first draft that, you know, he'll be happy with, that he can work with. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of both ends of the spectrum. I mean, there are plenty of all nighters in the White House where I'd agonize over some certain speech just to get it to him and get it in a place where he could work on it and be happy. And then you watch him in a fraction of the time. Uh, take it somewhere better. But he was always good about reminding us, you know, when we were down about it, that what we gave him was something good enough to work with. Um, it was only it was only truly a failure if he sent the entire thing back to you without any edits and said, let's start over. Tune in for Story in the Public Square, Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. with an encore Sunday mornings at 11. Marking its 20th anniversary this year, New England Emmy-nominated Ghost and Vampire Legends of Rhode Island examines the origins of mysteries around the ocean state, such as the clip you're about to see. Another traumatic and untimely death took place in Portsmouth during the late 1600s. This incident involved an elderly woman, Rebecca Cornell, who was found burned to death in her home. It was obviously an accident, or at least so it was said when she was buried. Not too long after her burial, however, uh, one of her brothers, his name was John Briggs, rode into Newport from Portsmouth where they were living and told the magistrates here that Rebecca had been murdered. As evidence, he claimed that the ghost of Rebecca had come to him at night and that she had entered his room glowing with light like the dawn and revealed herself to him and said, see how I am burned over my body, and then showed him that she had a wound in her chest and that that wound clearly was actually what had killed her. As strange as Briggs' stories sounded, the magistrate decided to investigate. The um, constables and magistrates came out to Portsmouth. They dug up Mrs. Cornell's body, and when they looked more closely, they found that beneath the scarring and the um, charring of the fire, there was, in fact, a terrible wound in her chest. Thomas Cornell, Rebecca's own son, became the prime suspect in the investigation. The magistrates went to his house and allegedly found a piece of Mrs. Cornell's spinning wheel actually broken off a jagged piece and felt that that was almost certainly the murder weapon. When uh, Thomas Cornell came to trial, not only was the murder weapon apparently uh, um, there in evidence, but people said that Mrs. Cornell was in fear for her life. She was supporting her son, who didn't have a job and was something of a drunkard, and she had been planning to move away to Pennsylvania. It's possible that he went upstairs to confront her, maybe he was in an argument with her, possibly drunk at the time, and somehow picked up a piece of her broken spinning wheel or maybe even snapped it off and struck her down with it. Well, realizing what he'd done, he must have decided to burn her body in order to cover up the evidence of what he'd done. And I guess since she tended to sit in her rocking chair in front of the fire, it seemed like a perfectly logical way to go. And of course, ultimately, nobody suspected until this strange story came out where John Briggs came and told about the mysterious vision that he'd had. On the strength of that vision, Thomas Cornell was brought to trial and ultimately convicted for the murder of his mother. He was hung right in the town square in front of the old colony house here in downtown Newport. Probably the only murder trial in all of American history where a ghost provided the damning uh, testimony. Enjoy the rest of this classic documentary on watch.ripbs.org. Up next, Oh My Gord, the Jack-O-Lantern Spectacular Story features the extraordinary artistic feat that takes place at Roger Williams Park Zoo every October. With more than 5,000 carved pumpkins on display and visitors from all over the world each season, this is not your average pumpkin show. Usually they're just shocked that there's so many pumpkins that are real. You know, I think they think that they're gonna be these fake pumpkins on a trail and they come and they tell a story and they're real. 
while the show is going on, I'm drawing another one to replace the one that's on display that's rotting. People are always shocked that we put this much time into something that dies so quickly, but we walk around here every day and we're in awe of each other's work. When I first started working here, some of the other artists used to say they'd get this like itchy feeling, you know, right around July. <laughs> Can't wait for September. The gig doesn't stop. It's not a nine to five. It's, it's like a 45 day marathon. Every October at dusk, the Roger Williams Park Zoo transforms into an entirely different animal. And while you can still see exotic creatures, you'll also catch glimpses of superheroes, fine art, American history, and even decomposing composers. It's all part of a spectacle you have to see to believe. But before we get any further ahead with our story, let's rewind to the beginning. <laughs> If you've ever wondered why Americans love carving pumpkins, here's the scoop. The jack-o'-lantern tradition originated from an Irish myth brought to America by immigrants. But instead of using potatoes and turnips for carving, the pumpkin became the American fruit of choice. Over 30 years ago, John Reckner saw a mountainside display of hundreds of carved pumpkins in northern Vermont. I'm back home in Oxford, Massachusetts, taking my dogs for a walk through the woods early one evening, and I'm thinking about all these hundreds of pumpkins I saw on that mountain, and it's like a light bulb went off. A light bulb that resulted in passion for pumpkins, a company that now runs events in Rhode Island, Kentucky, and Minnesota. But back in 1988, John worked with family, friends, and fellow artists to put on a show in his hometown of Oxford, Massachusetts. Our initial season, we did, I think, three or 400 pumpkins behind the school. And the school was kind of involved in the process as a fundraising event. And every year, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. It has absolutely nothing to do with Halloween. It's just that this is the time of year that pumpkins are ripe, and it's an illuminated art show. Things really took off after the Library of Congress featured the production in its Local Legacies Project, a once-in-a-lifetime initiative celebrating the richness of American culture. The City of Providence found out about us. They came up and made the connection, brought us to the zoo, and this is just the perfect marriage. The show started at the zoo in 2001. Thought it would be a great setting here amongst our wetlands trail and the woods to have this incredible pumpkin show. Incredible, spectacular, whatever you want to call them, these are not your average carved pumpkins. And while millions of people from near and far have oohed and aahed during the jack-o'-lantern spectacular, the behind the scenes logistics are equally awe-inspiring. So how exactly does one create an event that depends on the mercy of the weather and decomposing fruit? People don't realize that this show actually is a year-round production, that it, the planning for this starts months and months in advance. Enjoy the entire Oh My Gore documentary on watch.ripbs.org. And now, presented this month exclusively online, Art Inc. pulls back the curtain on the infinite expressions of art. In this featured segment, artists from Everett, company, stage, and school come together to heal lifelong trauma and share what bliss means to each of them. What am I doing? What do I need? One, two, three, bliss, bliss party! Hi, I'm Aaron Jungles. I'm co-artistic director here at Everett. Everett's been around for 36 years now. We started out sort of as a family company, my mom and my two sisters, and then we quickly grew from there. 
So Everett's work um, is a mix of dance and theater and video projection, and we wanted to create a place for diversity, a place where anybody could come from any social background, any economic background, any um, cultural background, and bring what they love to do, and just have a place where kind of joy could spring up, and, um, and I think it's been that for, for a long time. So Bliss Body, kind of, the idea came out of work we had done previously. The piece was kind of about how you heal from developmental trauma. But all of that work made us feel like we needed to explore the other side of things. With sort of the content of the piece, it forces you to look at yourself for real and look at yourself on a much more honest level. We were, we were definitely looking at our traumas much more in the beginning to kind of clear up the air so we can find our bliss and to get to what the piece is about. It's like you are the moon. It's like everything is revolving around you in that moment. It's been growth. The healing part actually comes in taking what we do here and incorporating it into our, our regular lives. And that's where the healing comes. Learning not to be angry, learning to keep, you know, to walk away from situations that are not productive. Yes, it's been healing for me, you know, taking what I have here and incorporating it into the real world. Continue watching this story and more at ripbs.org slash art inc. Thank you for joining us this month. We'll see you next time in case you missed it.